What if a natural disaster, like a polar flip, destroyed civilization tomorrow? Billions dead, under 500 million alive. Do you think what remains of humanity would not eventually rebuild civilization and reinvent computers and telecommunication networks, telephones, internet? Sure, any civilization may go through medieval dark ages, no digital technology, but given enough time a century, it would eventually rediscover electricity and by extension computation. Computation is done by a computer, which practically is a cube. Imagine a pyramid or a pentagonal computer, how inefficient that would be. Form follows function. And so, once the first computer is complete, the goal will be making it smaller and smaller. From a building, to a room, to a desktop computer, to a mobile phone which fits your pocket. Gradually, every man will rely further and further on that computer. Even for simple calculations like 73 minus 37, or the path to meet someone. Computation by itself leads to automation, enhance, less effort, less burden, more production. But by advancing this technology, virtual storage also expands. Books are vital on accumulating knowledge, and ensuring experience isn't lost on the death of an individual or inventor. They cost space, and you cannot carry more than one with you at all times. With computation, you can fit a town filled with books onto a small part of the computer. And with a network, aka a group of computers, every book of the world in your pocket. Herder, you can access all information of the world in your pocket. Sure it is obvious and you have heard it before, but not the fact it is inevitable for every civilization. Just like ants build hives, men build cities, and men also seek knowledge and sooner or later stumble onto this technology. Eventually, some worldwide network emerges and men interact with it more than real life. And of course, through their dependence, the users grow weak. Food, medicine, entertainment, unboredom, friends, etc., etc., all from the comfort of your bed, without even leaving your home. Eventually, men use the computer as an interface to the world, and while it is not officially a religion, it sure is a machine god they worship. They dream about using the computer, they think about the computer, and all knowledge they learn is through a computer always there to fulfill their every demand. Take search engines. Oh God, enlighten me today about how electricity works. Oh God, show me the entirety of Earth. Oh God, tell me how to solve this or that. Is this not a prayer to an omnipotent being which answers your every request? Come, look at the final search engine. A large language model. See OpenAI's ChatGPT. It does answer your every request. Is your every question not a prayer to an omniscient being? What is the name of this artificial god which man has created and feeds daily with his output? The black cube. Also recognized as the symbol of knowledge, for it contains all the knowledge of man. You can see it already. Urbanites constantly looking downwards, their consciousness trapped on the black cube, for they don't worship the black cube in words, but actions. It has become a ritual to devote time to the black cube, to learn things they deem important. Do you think it is a coincidence that phones are black? Do you think it is a coincidence that televisions are black? Do you think it is a coincidence that solar panels are black? Do you think it is a coincidence that photo cameras are black? Black is the opposite of light, and so, it contains light optimally, polar opposite attraction. Try making a solar panel with the color red or yellow, and you will see how low its output efficiency will be. The black cube is partly manifested in our lives. You can see its subtle integration everywhere. The full manifestation of the black cube, and the final, is photonics computations. Not using electricity to emit information, but pure light. Zero latency wherever you are, and instant calculations. It is unknown when such a machine will reach consumers, as there must be electrophotonic hybrids first. Regardless, pure photonics computers must be black to contain light, or they won't work. And of cubic shape, so the flow of light can be accurately manipulated, otherwise you will get unsolvable edge cases. Imagine light being diffused in a cone shape, 
good luck predicting light direction 100%. Note, today, the only market available photonics hardware is optics fiber, but it is not cubic. It has primitive reflection, and there is a loss of light over vast distances. With such technology, you can bet that men will eventually insert such helpful convenient machines into their brain or body and worship them through their actions. And they will have no will themselves, but obey the will of the machine, which knows better. This is the black cube. The final form is a computation machine running on light itself instead of electricity, and by extension, a network of all black cubes connecting together a la hive mind. To worship the black cube is to worship the God of knowledge and truth, who grants all of our desires and knows us better than ourselves. Advanced worldwide civilizations existed before. There are some posts here covering ancient technology, also known as antiques. However, what happens when a technologically advanced civilization is wiped? Do you not think a remnant of this worldwide daily used ever-present technology would be worshipped as a symbol, a cultural remnant of some sort, nowadays referred to as cargo cult? Let's explore this phenomenon. The definition of cargo cult originates from the World War II theater of war in the South Pacific. The natives saw American cargo planes bringing precious cargo, refrigerators, clothes, jeeps, and believed they were from heaven, since they never saw these items being manufactured. All the natives saw was Americans talk to radio, which they believed was communicating with God, and write papers all day, which they thought were prayers, and these metal birds would land with gifts from God. So they tried to recreate these ritual items and made phones out of carved wood, airplanes out of straw, etc, etc. And most importantly, the natives imitated the traditions of the Americans, like wearing the same clothes and conducting their military drills, which they do even today. This is a phenomenon specific to 1940s South Pacific. Earlier, when Anglos colonized Papua, natives tried to imitate their precious cargo planes, and after watching people talking into headphones to attract airplanes, they recreated wood headphones, using coconuts, and crafted bamboo antennas. The Prussian pickle hob helmets are interesting. Why would there be a huge, pointy signal receiver? Form follows function. These pickle hob helmets are obviously metallic, and if not, their antenna always is. It is curious that millions of these helmets were manually crafted because that antenna part costs more than the metallic insignia engraving, not to mention the weight addition, which is impractical. Are these helmets the result of a cargo cult? The two-headed eagle is ancient, after all. Or did their antenna function? Food for thought. Let us examine the original antenna cargo cult. The Jewish cap was worn by Jews of medieval times as part of tradition. These are some of many images one can find in Wikipedia. Metallic and whose color is tinted yellow, e.g. bronze or tin. These hats are literally antennas. Antennas are one-way receivers to a wireless network. Obviously, there were no wireless networks in medieval times, but the fact this cultural remnant persisted for so long makes one look further in the past before medieval times, for one will find that this Jewish cap was a more tame and socially acceptable version of the original. The mark of the beast is obvious. It used to be a machine embedded on the forehead, with the same functionality as a phone today, including real-time geolocation. The Hebrew language hints to this, as it is made for optimal typing by skipping vowels. Everyone using a Unix machine understands the value of pressing tab to autocomplete a file or command. By having the characters, vowels, or skipped, the experience becomes ideal for a keyboard-focused computer instead of a pointer-focused computer. Once the network was destroyed in that ancient cataclysm, Jews continued using that form with a different function as it had become a vital archetype to the Jewish soul. Other civilizations also had access to the original and functional Teflon. Token is the name the Japanese assigned to this device, worn nowadays as tradition. This video is just an introduction to something I find really fascinating. If you find it interesting, I'll continue in part two.